Um, so anyways, the title of the paper is uh, Changing Demands on Agriculture Land, Our Land, uh, Our Reforms Urgent. Um, my co-authors have already been acknowledged, but I, I do want to make a special acknowledgement of Margaret Graves, who has done a lot of work on this uh, paper. And initially when we started, I thought Margaret was a very idealistic, naive kind of person. And, uh, and I'm not so sure that's true anymore. Uh, I wonder if the other three of us were a little bit maybe uh, not jaded, but a little set in our ways. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so it was a very good mix having the three of us uh, together. So anyways, uh, if we look at uh, the demands on land, they really haven't changed over time. If we look a way back when, when land was abundant, population was small, um, our demands on land were really very much the same still. We were looking at uh, feed, fuel, fiber, uh, food, and, and ultimately we wanted a functional ecosystem. Again, back then, the uh, population was small. We had lots of land. In Canada, we've got 50 to 60 million hectares of land uh, available to us. That represents about 7% of our land base. 5% uh, uh, of that 7% uh, is class one, two, three land, uh, which you would call dependable land, and, and, uh, and the rest would be what we would call marginal land. Now, having said that, uh, the nature of our demand hasn't changed, but certainly the magnitude of the demand for the different types of uh, products has changed. And so if we look at 1991, and, and the fellow in the slide there that I didn't introduce, I call him uh, JP for short. His name's Joe Public, okay? And, and back when he was, uh, uh, there was abundant land, you know, what he received from land was sort of a functional thing. I'm not so sure if he was really happy about it. Uh, but he was satisfied for the most part. Now, if we fast forward to 1991, uh, since 1951, we've taken out about 1.8 million hectares of land, uh, uh, and that tends to be our class one, two, three land, our dependable land. Uh, the, the remaining land that is in uh, uh, crop production represents the bulk of our class one, two, three land that's available. And since uh, 1991, uh, there's been concern that any increase in, in land, if there has been any, has been taken from marginal land sources, okay? Uh, now, JP, uh, Joe Public, you know, he's fairly happy at this point in time in 1991. He's got a relatively uh, cheap food supply. He's only spending about 11.3% uh, of his net income. He's got a diverse, uh, nutritious uh, food source. You know, we are using some of our production for f uh, fuel and, and, uh, and fiber, but the issue really hasn't hit center stage yet from a public point of view. Uh, yes, there's some uh, uh, ecosystem issues uh, that are there, but in general, Joe Public, he's fairly satisfied that uh, these issues are being taken care of. And if I think of Western Canada, for example, introduction of no-till, reduction of summer uh, fallow acres, uh, diversification of rotations, those are the kind of things that I think were keeping uh, Joe Public largely appeased. Having said that all, you know, if you look at our agriculture, even in 1991, I think you could say that it was a fairly production-intensive type of system, okay? Uh, over the last pr previous 40 years, we've certainly intensified. 20 years since 1991, we've further intensified. And, and regardless of what metric you use, intensification, I think, would be the way you would describe our system. Uh, since 1991, our total uh, area under production is largely plateaued. Um, you know, prior to that, we've been seeing increases. Any productivity increases in Canada have come from uh, increases in land base. Since 1991, our land base cannot be uh, uh, considered in terms of uh, contributing largely to uh, productivity increases. Um, since 1991, we've seen continued loss due to urbanization. So we've been able to maintain a stable uh, product, uh, land base for production, but that's come from somewhere. And there is a suspicion that that's come from, to a large extent, uh, non-dependable lands. Uh, you can see in this slide that we've seen a reduction in wheat acreage. We've seen a reduction in summer fallow acreage. And um, 
uh, certainly reduction summer fallow has been a good thing. Uh, we've seen increases in canola, so the uh, distribution of how we're using that land base has changed. Um, but I think the key point here is since 1991, we've largely seen a plateau in, uh, in uh, a land available for production. Um, now, having said that, again, since 1991, we've seen overall production increase. Uh, that production increase, like I said already, has not come from more land. It's come from productivity on a per unit area basis from various crops that we grow. And you can see in this slide, we've got corn, soybeans, canola, wheat, um, all increasing over time in productivity. Uh, corn, for example, has been a real success story. Since about 1950, we've seen about a 200% yield increase in uh, yields per acre of corn. I'm not sure what's going on with tame hay there, if that's some sort of a reporting uh, issue there, I'm not sure, but uh, the point is overall we've seen productivity per uh, unit area increases. Another metric you might want to look at is uh, the concept of uh, uh, farm size. We've seen a, a big reduction in number of farms and a big increase in uh, number of acres farmed uh, per farm. And this has some real implications as well because with uh, increasing farm size, it changed the way uh, farmers operate. Uh, they no longer operate necessarily on managing on a field level. Uh, they're they're going to manage on a farm level or on a section level. Uh, this has been motivated by you know, improvements in equipment, improvements in herbicides uh, that have reduced cost of production, enabled this larger scale production. But it does come at potentially a cost where, again, you're farming at a larger scale not perhaps considering issues at the smaller scale. Um, in Ontario, and I suspect it's true in Western Canada, you're seeing more rental land, and that has implications for how land is managed. We're seeing more removal of fence rows, a, a reduction in woodlot size, as, as uh, growers try to get that scale of farm or field size or farm size uh, to enable that kind of uh, scale of operation. Uh, another metric you might want to use is this issue of uh, livestock production. We've seen a dramatic reduction in a number of uh, uh, livestock farms, uh, but product uh, production totals of livestock have increased dramatically. Here, for example, we've got uh, hog production, and you can see that number of hog farms has decreased dramatically uh, while the uh, uh, total production uh, has, has increased dramatically. Um, and, and that, has, again, has implications because uh, it, it says something about concentration of manure supply. It says something about uh, rotation complexity. For example, again, in Ontario, and I suspect it's the same thing here in Western Canada, if you have hog farms, you tend to have very simple rotations that are dominated by uh, corn in the rotation. And again, as we'll talk about later, that has some significant implications. Now, to a certain extent, this is uh, perhaps a, uh, a concern, but one of the big benefits uh, in terms of productivity that we've seen in the livestock industry that I'm gonna make a couple points about as the talk progresses, is this concept of this huge uh, gains in, in, in efficiency of production. Um, there was a study that was done by uh, uh, I've got White et al, and it's a study looking at the production uh, efficiency in 19, from 1951 to 2001 in Ontario. And again, it's an Ontario study, but I think the results apply quite well to the rest of Canada. But in that study, they looked at a number of things. And for example, they looked at uh, uh, pork production. From 1951 to 2001, we produced three times the pork in, in Canada. And we did that with 50% less land. And the reason we were able to do that is because crop yields went up, but also feed conversion efficiencies went way down. Uh, we went from a feed conversion efficiency of 3.5 to 2.5 to 1 over that time period. Now, the story in broiler chickens is even more remarkable. Uh, during that same time period, we produced almost eight times the chicken with only 15% more land. 
our fee conversion went from about 6.1 in 1951 to a current level of about 1.75 to 1 uh, in, in uh, 2011, 2012 right now. The reason I say that is because uh, we've made significant gains in terms of fee conversion. The question is, can we continue those types of gains into the future? And I don't think we can. As was mentioned, I'm involved in the uh, broiler industry. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've probably gone from a fee conversion of about 1.85 to 1.75 to 1. We're not going to make big gains in the future. So if we keep on eating more meat uh, as population increases, that has to come from uh, increased yield potential. We're not going to get this benefit, I don't think, certainly not in broilers. Maybe in some of the other livestock industries it's different, but I, I don't think so. I, I think our, 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 ben, our gains in feed conversion perhaps have plateaued. Okay, so um, uh, the other way we can look at intensity is this issue of input use. And this is a slide looking at nitrogen use and uh, uh, nitrogen rate per hectare uh, across Canada has increased. Total nitrogen use per hectare has increased. And if you look at that bottom line, the last uh, 10 years or so, it looks like we're, we're at about a plateau in terms of uh, nitrogen use efficiency or the, the amount of nitrogen used per ton of production. Now, that, that's one uh, indicator, nitrogen, but if you look at inputs in general, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, computed uh, input efficiency index and uh, productivity over the period of 1961 to 2011 increased by 1.6% each year. Our input use increased by 0.7% each year, indicating that our input use efficiency has indeed improved over time. Nitrogen might be a bit of an exception. Certainly our energy use efficiency in agriculture uh, has improved uh, fairly dramatically. So, so however you look at it, uh, we are seeing an increase in um, intensity of production. And, and, and if we look now at 2009, several years ago, our population is now 6.7 billion. Uh, we've further taken up land for urban uh, um, you know, development. Uh, how much land that is, I don't know. Um, our uh, land that's available for crop production, like I said, has exceeded our dependable land. So we're probably cutting into that native land uh, segment and it's uh, decreasing even though we do have efforts to try to protect it. Um, we have increased our food production and feed production. Okay, we're exporting about 45% of our uh, uh, production at that point in time. Uh, we're seeing an increase in, in fuel and to a certain extent fiber production. I don't have a lot of good statistics, but I'll give you one in that area in Ontario. And I apologize for all the Ontario examples, but I, I think it uh, uh, reflects uh, uh, the country in general. But in Ontario, according to the grain farmers of Ontario, 40% of our corn goes into industrial purp uh, purposes, okay? And, and that certainly was not the case uh, in 1991. Um, and so if you look at JP, Joe Public, you know, he's still happy. He's only spending 9.8% of his income on, uh, on food. But having said that, there is a, uh, you know, to a certain extent, JP is getting a little bit concerned. And he's becoming concerned because, you know, if you're a lower income individual, that percentage is probably quite a bit higher, and there are concerns, even in Canada, about food insecurity at some of those higher prices. And on top of that, food versus fuel issues are coming into play, and other uh, environmental issues are coming into play. And one of the issues that I'll highlight here is this issue of water quality. Um, you know, we thought we had this resolved a number of years ago, but the problem in Lake Erie is coming back. This is a photo in 2011 of algal blooms uh, in, in, in the fall. Uh, we saw them in 2012 as well. This is not unique. We see them in Lake Simcoe in Ontario, Chesapeake Bay on the uh, East Coast, uh, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, th uh, th this is becoming a major concern. And it's not just uh, an Eastern uh, North American issue. Uh, this is a uh, 
report that I found on the web uh, by uh, uh, Robert Sanford, and it talks about some of the concerns in Western Canada. And specifically, it talks about uh, Lake Winnipeg, the fact that um, algal blooms in Lake Winnipeg are becoming the norm, and the magnitude of size of the algal bloom is increasing year to year. And so these water quality issues uh, are starting to come into play, and, and Joe Public is becoming concerned about them. Now, now if we look forward to 2020, okay, so 2009, we're starting to get some concerns. Um, generally, uh, JP's pretty happy still. But if we look forward to 2020, um, JP might not be as uh, uh, happy as he is currently about the situation. Um, you know, we're going to continue to have some increase in, in urban use of land, and that's going to take away potentially from crop production land. And, and again, when we, when we take this land away, it tends to be class one, two, three land. You know, we do not de develop typically on our marginal soils. We see that in terms of urban development. We see that in terms of uh, development on farm. I farm in a region. All the uh, construction of new dairy barns, new poultry barns occurs on the best land. It occurs on the best land because that's the cheapest to develop. If you have to start backfilling uh, a land due to slope or whatever, it's hugely expensive and it, and it typically doesn't occur. And so that urbanization is going to be a, a problem because it, it has the potential to take away uh, land and it's good to hear that uh, land protection uh, is still being encouraged. Uh, but we are potentially going to have to produce more food to feed that population. And remember, it's not going to come from uh, more land coming into development. Chances are we've plateaued and also remember it's not going to, uh, we're not going to have this gain potentially of improved livestock feed conversion rates. So it's all going to have to come from yield increases. And that I think is a, quite an important point. And so JP's becoming concerned. Uh, he's concerned that in, increased costs for food are going to be there. And he's starting to be concerned about these uh, functional ecosystem issues. Okay, so, so, so this is uh, where it was an interesting process to write this. When we were writing this, we got to this point and I said, okay, so the question really is, uh, can we sustainably produce that amount of additional food? And this is where Margaret came back and said, you know, Bill, you just can't accept that demand is going to increase. You first have to look at, can we alter that demand side of things? Right? And so uh, Margaret, uh, uh, I think, argued quite convincingly that we had to look at this demand side. And so certainly you can look at the, fee, uh, sorry, the fuel and fiber uh, uh, market. I'm not going to talk about that, but that certainly is an issue. I'm not sure there's uh, the political will to reduce uh, demand on that side from agriculture, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to talk about it. But one of the ways you can reduce demand is you look at this issue of waste. If you were to think of waste in uh, the food system, uh, and I wasn't aware of this, but uh, the waste level is actually about 30 uh, to 50 percent. We waste a, a dramatic amount of food along the whole ch chain in, in, in our system. And so the question is, is there opportunity to reduce that amount of waste? If you reduce that amount of waste, um, yes, you'll reduce the food demand. Um, and yes, you could reduce the amount of cropland required. Uh, yes, you might actually free up land for uh, f uh, fiber and fuel. Um, and that's all good. But how are you going to achieve that? If we look at JP in the picture here, he doesn't look too happy. And I'm not sure what he's trying to say. But uh, I don't think he's too happy about this. Because the reality is if you're going to try to reduce uh, food waste, you can try to do it through education, but I think the best way to achieve that is you increase price. Uh, if it's expensive, you don't waste. If it's uh, cheap, you tend to waste. And currently, we've got a cheap food supply, easy to waste. And, and so, so I'm, yes, it's possible to reduce demand in this way, but I'm, I'm not sure how easy it is. The other way to reduce demand is if you look at that picture of food, 
you know, we've got a lot of meats, we've got a lot of processed foods and aren't real well represented there. But it, it's a high protein, high energy, um, you know, uh, high land demanding type of system. And so the question is, can we change diet to reduce demand? And so in this slide, you know, if we could somehow coerce Joe Public to eat an eco-friendly, nutritious, uh, you know, totally mixed uh, ration or total mixed ration, similar to what we have here, you know, we could potentially dramatically reduce uh, waste in the system, do it at a low cost, uh, reduce our demand on the uh, uh, land base. But the reality is, again, you know, I don't think Joe Public's going to be too happy about that. He likes his uh, 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 varied uh, diet, and, uh, and rightly so. And so he's not going to be happy about it because you know, I don't think he's going to enjoy eating uh, you know, that kind of restricted diet. And on top of that, um, if we move to that kind of system, you know, we potentially undercut a huge industry, the food industry, and undercut jobs that are required uh, for Joe Public. And so I'm not convinced that that is necessarily a good way to go either. Um, and so we're left with this question, you know, can we reduce demand? Maybe. But ultimately, uh, uh, when we look forward to 2020, demand's probably going to increase. And the question is, can we increase production intensity further? And again, that production intensity will probably be represented by increased yields, not by increased land or improved feed conversion rates uh, to a great extent. And so the question is, can we do that? Now, some people will look at that and say, well, you know, yields are bad. You know, yields wear out of soil and, 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 and yield by virtue of just uh, being demanding on a system is, is not sustainable. And, and I really beg to differ that, with that. And, and we uh, uh, indicate that in our paper, that yield progression can be a good thing and, uh, and uh, it will not necessarily wear out of soil. And, and I use this as an example. Uh, this is uh, David Hula from Virginia. Uh, he has uh, been a contestant for a number of years in the National Corn Growers uh, Competition in the United States. Uh, last year, he won with a yield of, uh, uh, I think, uh, I can't read it here, and I can't read it there. I think it was 384 bushels per acre. I, I may not be quite correct there, but 384, okay? And, and, and a normal yield for corn is about 140, 150. You know, so he's almost triple. The year before, he won with 429 bushels per acre. And then in the last decade, he's won something like three or four times in addition to that, okay? So he's a consistent winner. But what's remarkable about this is that uh, he lives next to the Jamestown River in Virginia. For those of you that are familiar with uh, the history of the US, the Jamestown settlement represents the first European settlement in the United States, and that's exactly where he farms. They settled in this, uh, early 1600s, 1607, I believe. So this land has been under cultivation for uh, 400 years, and he's still able to uh, produce uh, in excess of 350, 400 bushels per acre. So it is possible as long as the inputs are available to maintain that, okay? 